Before proceeding, please make sure to subscribe to Dental Maniac and turn on the bell icon for upcoming videos. You can always support my work with your likes, comments and shares. For latest updates, you can join me on Facebook and Instagram at Dental Maniac. For images and transcripts, please visit my Patreon page, the link for which is given here above. Antibiotics are medications that destroy or slow down bacterial growth. Depending on these effects, an antibiotic can act as a bactericidal or a bacteriostatic agent. While a bactericidal antibiotic kills the bacteria, a bacteriostatic antibiotic stops bacterial growth. As for both types of antibiotics, bacteria are involved. That's why it's essential to understand a bacterial cell before we begin with the mechanism of action of different types of antibiotics. So let's draw a typical bacterial cell here and let's just not talk about the individual characteristics of a gram-positive or a gram-negative bacterium. A simple bacterial cell is made up of multiple layers and these multiple layers all together is called the cell envelope. Let's take a small section of this envelope and look at different layers of a bacterial cell that make up this envelope. A simple bacterial cell has got an outer sticky capsule which is made up of polysaccharides. Polysaccharidal capsule helps in adherence of a bacterial cell to other cells. Underlying the capsule is the next layer of cell wall which is made up of peptidoglycan chain where glycan means sugars and peptide means protein. The peptidoglycan chain on a close-up view is made up of alternating subunits of N-acetylmuramic acid or NAM and N-acetylglucosamine or NAC. Both of these are derivatives of sugars. Peptide chains extends from each NAM and NAC subunits. The NAM and NAC subunits are made in rows and each of the subunits in alternating rows are cross-linked through the enzyme transpeptidases. The cell wall is a tough layer that gives bacterium a characteristic shape and prevents it from osmotic and mechanical stress. The third inner layer of a bacterial cell is the layer of the cell membrane or the cytoplasmic membrane. This layer surrounds the cytoplasm and other organelles. The cell membrane of a bacterial cell, just like the cell membrane of a human cell, is made up of phospholipid bilayer. An important structure embedded within this cytoplasmic membrane are the penicillin binding proteins aka transpeptidase enzyme. The transpeptidase or penicillin binding proteins as said before cross links the peptidoglycan chain and as the name suggests these penicillin binding proteins has the capability to bind with the penicillin or with the beta lactam drugs as well. And thus the cross linkage between the NAM and NAC subunits in alternating rows is inhibited. The cytoplasmic membrane also prevents ions from flowing into or out of the cell and maintains the cytoplasmic and bacterial cell components into a defined space. Inside the cell we have the DNA, RNA and ribosomes and also some other organelles. In addition, a bacterial cell also has small hairy outgrowths scattered throughout the cell called pili and also a long extension called flagellum. Where pili helps in cellular adhesion, a flagellum mainly performs motility in bacteria. Now coming back to the antibacterial drugs, they can be classified based on the mechanism of their antimicrobial activity. The main groups are antibiotics that inhibit cell wall synthesis, antibiotics that disrupt the cell membrane, antibiotics that inhibit protein synthesis, antibiotics that inhibit nucleic acid synthesis and then we have antibiotics that inhibit metabolic pathways in bacteria. In today's lecture we will look into antibiotics that inhibit bacterial cell wall synthesis. Antibiotics that can inhibit bacterial cell wall synthesis are penicillins, cephalosporins, carbapenems and monobactams. In today's lecture we will look into penicillin and cephalosporins. These drugs that inhibit cell wall synthesis are also called beta-lactams. A beta-lactam drug consists of a beta-lactam ring in their chemical structure. The mechanism of action of all beta-lactams is almost the same. Let's look at the mechanism of action of these cell wall inhibitors or beta-lactams. Beta-lactams act as bactericidal drugs and they inhibit cell wall synthesis in three simple steps. 
the drug first diffuses through the bacterial capsule and cell wall and then binds with the penicillin binding proteins located at the bacterial cytoplasmic membrane. Once a beta-lactam drug binds to the penicillin binding proteins, the penicillin binding proteins are deactivated, hence the peptidoglycan chains cannot be cross-linked. This causes the cell wall to break apart. As a result, water rushes into the bacterial cell through these small breaks in the cell wall and causes the cell to swell and then burst into fragments. Furthermore, the autolytic enzymes get stimulated which causes the bacterial cells to break down further and the cellular components are then digested. Beta-lactam derived antibiotics can be considered one of the most important antibiotic classes but prone to clinical resistance. Throughout the years, vast indication of the drug has caused bacterial resistance towards the beta-lactam drugs. This resistance occurs as a result of the expression of one of the many genes for the production of beta-lactamases, also called penicillinases, by some bacteria. Beta-lactamases, as the name implies, are a class of enzymes that break open the beta-lactam ring within a beta-lactam drug. More than 1,800 different beta-lactamase enzymes have been documented in various species of bacteria. Let's talk about the penicillin and cephalosporin drugs individually, both of which inhibit bacterial cell wall synthesis. Starting with penicillins, penicillin drugs are water-soluble drugs and are of three types. These are the natural penicillins, the semi-synthetic penicillins, and the anti-staphylococcal penicillins. The natural penicillins are narrow-spectrum penicillinase-susceptible drugs. These are the penicillin G and the penicillin V. Penicillin G is the drug of choice for syphilis caused by Tryponema pallidum and for gas gangrene caused by Clostridium perfringens. Penicillin V is mainly used in oropharyngeal infections. The drug can survive really well in acidic environment of the stomach. That's why it's only given in oral formulations. Semisynthetic penicillins, also known as wide-spectrum penicillinase susceptible drugs, examples of which are the ampicillin and amoxicillin. These drugs can fight infections arising from enterococci, including Haemophilus influenza, Escherichia coli, Listeria monocytogenesis, and Proteus mirabilis. The drugs although are of a wide spectrum, but still, they remain highly susceptible to penicillinases or beta-lactamases enzymes produced by gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. That's why these drugs are mostly given with clavulonic acid, which is a beta-lactamase inhibitor. Clavulonic acid binds with the beta-lactamase enzyme before the enzyme can bind and open up the beta-lactam ring of a drug, making the drug available for its intended action. The third type of penicillin are the anti-staphylococcal penicillins, and as the name suggests, these are indicated in staphylococcal infections. These are very narrow-spectrum penicillinase-resistant drugs. The anti-staphylococcal penicillins are namely the methicillin, nafcillin, oxacillin, and dicloxacillin. These drugs are only used in staphylococcal infections which are resistant to other types of penicillins. However, methicillin-resistant Staph aureus and methicillin-resistant Staph epidermidis are some resistant strains of staphylococcal infections known so far. Also, the anti-staphylococcal penicillin drugs have minimal to no effect against gram-negative bacteria. And this may be because of two reasons. The first reason might be the altered shape of the penicillin binding proteins, which inhibits binding of the drug with these proteins. Or it may be because of the decreased permeability of the drug. Beta-lactam drugs can penetrate easily in a gram-positive bacterium as compared to a gram-negative bacterium. Let's see why. So these are the simple diagrams of a gram-positive and of a gram-negative bacterial cell. In a gram-positive bacterium, the peptidoglycan layer is quite closer to the inner cytoplasmic membrane. Hence, the drug finds its way to the penicillin-binding proteins faster. However, in a gram-negative bacterium, the axis of the drug is halted by the presence of an extra or an outer cytoplasmic layer. 
Furthermore, a gram-positive bacterium secretes its beta-lactamase enzymes extracellularly, while a gram-negative bacterium produces their enzymes intracellularly within the periplasmic space, a space in between the inner and outer cytoplasmic membrane, hence making the enzyme always available there for any introduced beta-lactam drug. Let's now talk about cephalosporine antibiotics. Cephalosporines, just like the penicillins, are bactericidal drugs and work in a similar way to penicillins. The first cephalosporine drug was discovered in 1945. Scientists have been improving the structure of cephalosporines to make them even more effective against a wider range of bacteria. So far, there are five generations of cephalosporines based on the type of bacteria that they are most effective against. Let's state few points about each generation of cephalosporine drugs. The drugs in first generation acts as penicillin G substitutes. First generation cephalosporines are more effective against gram-positive bacteria, though they also work against some of gram-negative bacteria as well. These drugs are resistant to staphylococcal penicillinase and works effectively against methicillin-sensitive Staph aureus or MSSA. These drugs are effective against many strains of E. coli and Klebsiella pneumoniae. They are also active against gram-positive cocci including staphylococci and common streptococci. Some first-generation cephalosporines are used as prophylactic antibiotics for surgery as well. Second-generation cephalosporines, just like first-generation, are mainly effective against gram-positive bacteria and only against some of gram-negative bacteria. These are the only cephalosporines commercially available with appreciable activity against gram-negative anaerobic bacteria like Bacteroides fragilis. They are often used to treat respiratory infections such as bronchitis or pneumonia. Third-generation cephalosporines are effective against many gram-negative bacteria and bacteria that haven't responded to first- or second-generation cephalosporines. The third generation tend to be less active than previous generations against gram-positive bacteria. These are less potent against MSSA compared to the first generation. This class of drug is effective against enteric organisms. Ceftriaxone and Cefotaxime have become agents of choice in the treatment of meningitis. Drugs in fourth generation are administered parenterally only. Fourth generation cephalosporines work against both gram positive and gram negative bacteria. However, this class of drugs have wide spectrum antibacterial effects against aerobic gram negative organisms. They are generally used for more severe infections or for those with weakened immune systems. The fifth generation of cephalosporine drugs is an advanced generation of cephalosporines used to treat infections that are resistant to other antibiotics. These include infections caused by MRSA as well. Ceftaroline is the only drug in the United States effective against MRSA and is majorly indicated in skin infections. The drug has a unique structure which allow it to bind with penicillin binding proteins in MRSA and penicillin resistant streptococcus pneumoniae. If you think this video was really helpful, please make sure to subscribe and turn on the bell icon for upcoming videos. If you have got any questions or suggestions, you may just write them down in the comment box below. Thank you for watching.